ever wondered, what if Jesus had come on the scene at the baptism, maybe gone into the wilderness temptation, and then headed straight to the cross? What if he had been here 60 days rather than three and a half years? What would the difference be? You thought about that? We say, to say that he came to die. He, he was born to die. He, he came to give his life a ransom for the many. What would we be missing, though? Oh, my. Be missing the miracles. We'd be missing the great, unparalleled, unequal teaching that he gave. I think the most critical thing we'd be missing is we would be missing the teaching and the modeling of the very thing that would keep the gospel going once he ascended back to heaven. He wouldn't have called any disciples. He would not have trained the twelve to model what he taught them. To do the ultimate commandment. Remember we looked at this several years ago now. Excuse me, I've got a little uh, a sinus drainage tickle that's descended upon me this evening. But that commandment hiding in plain sight in Matthew 28, where he says, as you go, the, the, we call it the Great Commission, as you go, the imperative verb, remember, is make disciples. There, there are people that read Matthew, or misread it, and they say, well, the, the command is go. No, that's over in Mark's gospel where he commands go. In Matthew's gospel, Go as you go is a participle. It's just it's sort of the assumptive reality. I mean, Jesus knew what was coming. They were not going to be able to stay still. They were going to be hunted and, and flushed out, and they would go to the known world. As you go, then the imperative. Disciple. Make disciples of the people groups, of all the people groups. He tells them the pattern. They're baptizing them. We, we believe what, what that teaches is that when a disciple is identified when they've confessed faith in Christ, expressing the desire to follow him, that then they are immersed in the triune, the name of the triune God, and then uh, teaching them the same things Jesus had taught the twelve, that they were to teach these disciples wherever they went, wherever they made disciples, to do all the things he had commanded. So it comes, it's, a, it's a cyclical thing, isn't it? It goes in a cycle. You teach them, just as I've taught you to, to make disciples, you teach them to make disciples. And it continues, and it's an unbroken cycle of disciple making. And if he had, if he had come to earth, identified himself in, when, he, when he reached 27 to 30 years of age, depending on whose chronology you follow of the life of Christ, and then gone almost immediately to the cross, we would have, we would have been robbed in fact, I think it's safe to say we would not be Christians today. There would have, have been no one who had been taught to make disciples. And so that's what a wonderful legacy that is. It's, it's critical that we understand this about him. This series I have entitled uh, Following Jesus Day by Day because that's, that's what the disciples did. I mean, when we leave here tonight, we, we don't hang up our thoughts about following Jesus. We're going, to, we're going to pill our heads tonight. We're going to wake up tomorrow, Lord willing. And that's going to be another day, a new day, an opportunity to follow Jesus Christ, to, to, to obey him, which, of course, Jesus says in John's gospel, if you love me, you'll do what? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He who has my commandments, John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me and he'll be loved by my Father. So, so every day we live, every day that he lets us breathe the air of earth and we rise for new challenges, new opportunities, is a day to live in obedience to him. And the ultimate command is to make disciples. And so we're we're looking at following Jesus day by day, and, and, and tonight we're going to begin to unpack uh, a look. We're going to look at John's gospel. Jesus begins his disciple-making journey. Let me tell you just real quick, I want to give you a quick background in case you know this, many of you, but maybe you've forgotten it. We need to bring it to the forefront. If you want to know the life of Jesus Christ, you study the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when you, when you can look at them in the Greek, it's fascinating because there are whole sections of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are verbatim. And what you learn is that they collected their material for this from common sources. They did their own investigation, but they collected material from common sources. And so they are called, because of this, of this reality, they are called the synoptic gospels. That's a, the word is S-Y-N and O-P-T-I-C, and, and simply means sin, which is, uh, which is uh, seen, I mean, I mean together, pardon me, together, and then optic, seen together. The, you take them together and you get a nice picture of the life of Christ. Now John's gospel is different though. John's gospel was not so much... Uh, the Apostle John, who was, who was the youngest disciple in the bunch, he's not so much wanting to tell you a chronology of the life of Christ. He is wanting to interpret the life of Christ theologically. And he gives us these portraits. There are several portraits. I had the privilege, when I was in seminary a long time ago, of studying under Dr. Huber Drumright, one of the most tender-hearted, godly men I've ever known, but a, a New Testament scholar unequaled. And I took the Gospel of John from him. And what a delight that was. And he showed, some, showed me some things in the Gospel of John, showed us that I had never seen. He told us that there are portraits there. And the first portrait in John's Gospel is that John makes it plain by the way he, he introduces his Gospel treatise that Jesus is connected to the Creator. I want you to look at this with me just, just real quickly. John, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning then was the Word. The Word was face to face with God. And the Word was indeed God. Now, if we could put up the Greek version of the, of the Old Testament called the Septuagint and put it next to the, the Greek uh, New Testament Gospel of John, you would see that it, this, this, in the beginning, the same exact words are used. And so John lays the foundation for us to realize that just as God in the beginning created everything, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom we know from other passages like Colossians and places, who is the architect of creation, he comes in bodily form to recreate. Kenny Rogers had a song that was a big hit years and years ago called You Decorated My Life. You remember, if you're familiar with it, if you're Kenny Rogers fans, you'll remember that. Well, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus didn't decorate our lives. He recreates us. He makes us new so that the terms used, new birth, new life, from death to life, from, from bondage to freedom, just on and on. So John wants us to know that, that the one he's going to tell us about is tightly connected to the Creator God. And you read that if you read the prologue. You'll see that. But what I want to show you tonight, and as we begin thinking about the, the phases of Jesus' disciple-making ministry, I want to show you something. Perhaps you've seen this before. Perhaps I've even taught it before, and I just I don't I can't recall tonight at this time. What, what if you if I say Gen, Genesis creation? What do you think of quickly? Seven days, right? The first week, the six days where God created. Seventh day, He rests, right? You, this first week of of human history. John does something very similar, and he gives us, it's not, it's not obvious until you, until you understand his use of the next day, then the third day. He gives us a brief snapshot of the first week of Jesus' ministry. Let's look at this together just real quickly. In John chapter 1, verses 19 to 28, this is day one of Jesus' ministry. Now you've got to pay close attention or you're going to miss it. This is the testimony of John. When the, and he's talking about John the, the Baptist here. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? It's interesting, John confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. He knew what was behind their question. They were, they were pressing him to, was he going to identify himself as the, as the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one? They asked him, well, what then? Are you Elijah? 
You've got to understand these questions that they're asking him are designed to catch him as a blasphemer. Are you Elijah? Elijah had, had ascended in a chariot of fire to, to heaven. He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? In other words, that prophet? That prophet being the one who was to come to, uh, to identify as the Messiah. No. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, and of course this is, this is quoted in the, in the prophecies. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said. I am the voice. I am the messenger. Now they've been sent from the Pharisees, John tells us. So they ask him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? In other words, what's your authority? John answered them. Now pay close attention here. This is, this is where we'll miss it if we're not careful. I baptize with water, but among you stands one. Not among you is coming one. Among you stands one. Jesus is in that crowd. Among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. It was the lowest slave's responsibility to, to uh, take off the sandals of the master of the house and his family when they came in from walking on the dusty roads. It was, it was one of the lowest things they would do. There were other things too. And they would take the sandals off and they would wash the feet of the, of the master. John says, I'm not even worthy to do that to this one who stands presently among you and you do not know him. We're told that these things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptized. Not, not the Bethany of uh, where Lazarus and Mary and Martha live. That's a different Bethany. This is one outside of Jerusalem where John was baptizing. That's the first day. First day of Jesus' ministry, he is, he is standing anonymously at least anonymously to the crowd, watching, observing. Now, at some point, he is baptized. John doesn't bother to tell us about that, but look at, look at the next section, verses 29 to 34. The next day, so now here's day two, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me, comes a man who ranks before or higher than me because he was, that is, he existed before me. I want you to go back to the, to the narrative, the, the birth narrative. Remember, when Mary showed up to Elizabeth, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Mary has just conceived. And Elizabeth observes to Mary that the child in her womb leapt when he heard the voice of the mother of my Lord. So chronologically, John was conceived before Jesus, but he's telling us something here about Jesus' pre-existence. He existed before me. He is higher than I am. This is he, the Lamb of God. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. So he's talking about the baptism. John doesn't record the baptism, but we know that somewhere in, the, in that day one, day two movement, he baptized Jesus. And we know when we read the other gospel accounts, the, the dialogue that ensued there. Verse 33, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So the Lamb of God is the Son of God, John the Baptist says. That's day two. Day three, look at this and continue in verse 35, chapter one. The next day, so now we're into day three. Again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he was walking by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. 
It's clear at that point that John was the messenger. He was the forerunner. He was the one preparing the way. He was not about building, as, as rabbis would do, building his rabbinical school with his followers. He freely, gladly releases two of his disciples to follow Jesus. Jesus turned, verse 38, and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And it's at this point that we are introduced to the first phase of Jesus' disciple-making journey. He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. We're going to see in the course of this study four phases, four movements of Jesus intentionally making disciples. The first one is what we call come and see. The second is come and follow me. The third is come and be with me. And then the fourth is remain in me. We're going to see that play itself out in the Gospels. I want to finish this week and then we're going to talk about the significance of this. Day four. Look at verses 40 to 42. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So in this, this movement, they, they, they stayed with him. And the first opportunity he had, Andrew went and got his brother. Remember that. That's a model. That's a model for, for what, what is stirring in the heart of a new follower of Christ. You see, I think, I think we have unwittingly through the years somehow managed to pour cold water. Think about this. Go back to when you were converted. Now, you may have been a child when you were saved, and so this will not apply as obviously, but it still applies. At what point of contact does a person know the largest number of unconverted people that he, he or she has known in life? Is it at the point of conversion? You're being brought out of darkness into light, out of, out of the world uh, of sin into, into the glorious relationship with the Son of God. See, I think we have, we've not done right. We need to do a better job. Some course correction, if you please. Some, some exhortation to one another back and forth to free one another up and discover again that flaming ember that's in there. It's, it just needs to, be, it needs to be worked up. The Spirit needs to blow on it. That, that the, the compunction of someone who's encountered Jesus is to go and get those near and dear to them because he's valuable in that way. Andrew is a wonderful example. Now he doesn't say it here, but the, but the force of it is, what? Come and see. We found the Messiah. Come and see. And Peter goes. Simon goes. And he receives a name from Jesus. And, and that picture there is so powerful where Jesus is basically taking authority in his life and Peter is submitting to that authority. In other words, you, you know enough about Peter to know he was a rugged fisherman. He was, he was uh, impetuous. Uh, he would not, at the end of Jesus' ministry, hesitate to draw out a sword and take a fellow's ear off. I and mean, he was, this was a man. <laughs> and typically men would not allow another man to take authority over them. When Jesus gives him a new name, there's a relationship building here. Then look at day five, where they journey from Bethany to Bethsaida. John 1, 43 to 50. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael. And said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel, now is kind of sarcastic. He says, 
Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Na the, the city of Nazareth didn't have that good a reputation. It's, it is the early stages. You remember when Paul starts writing and he writes to the church at Corinth? If, if we lived in the New Testament times and grown up, Nazareth would have had a, had a bad connotation. Corinth did too. If you wanted to insult a woman in Paul's day, you would call her a Corinthian woman. That was all it took. Well, here Nazareth has this bad reputation. Can anything good come from Nazareth? It's a, it's a real mixed bag. Philip said to him, and this is so critical, what does Philip say to him? Come and see. Come and see. You see, Jesus is already imprinting, modeling his method on these early disciples that he calls. He had said to the two that left John the Baptist, come and see. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Here he is showing them his, his supernatural powers of observation. He can see through time and space. Now, the, we can't appreciate this, but the display of this was so overwhelming. Look at Nathaniel's answer, who just moments ago had been sarcastic. Well, I, I mean, can, you want to go see somebody that's from Nazareth? crying out loud what, what comes out of Nazareth that's any good and Jesus speaks a sovereign decree to him by what he has seen of him notice the response Nathaniel answered him Rabbi you are the son of God you are the king of Israel Jesus answered him because I said to you I saw you under the fig tree do you believe you will see greater things than these and boy did he did he <laughs> He saw the, those with crippled feet jump for joy. Those with withered hands extend a whole hand. Those with leprosy who were the outcasts be made clean. We mentioned this morning those who had died resuscitated back to life. What he saw when he was willing to open his eyes and see Jesus for who he was. And then this is this is not so obvious here, but if you, if you think about the days we're counting now, that was the fifth day. Look in John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. On the third day, so now, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day. He's counted out for us the first week of Jesus' ministry. And it's on the seventh day. It's very interesting. In the Old Testament, on the seventh day, God rested from his labors. The new covenant mediator... The new creator, the recreator, takes the seventh day to manifest his first miracle. And it is a miracle of his heart for sustaining and blessing people. Look at this. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana, at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And you drop down, you know what happened there. They, they had run out of wine. There was an embarrassing situation for the steward, for, the, for the, the master of the party and for his wine steward. and What do we do? What do we do? And, and Mary says something. She and Jesus have an exchange, but she says something to the servants in verse 5. Do whatever he tells you. And that is a principle of submitting to Jesus Christ as the disciple maker. Do whatever he tells you. I heard a pastor preach years ago when I was an associate pastor at a church in Shreveport. I think it was Richard Jackson from North Phoenix Baptist Church. And he looked at this passage and he said, we learn from this that we do what is right simply because it is right and trust God to give the attending feelings, convictions on the matter. Whatever he says, whatever he tells you, do it. And see how that lines up with Jesus' last command on the Mount of Ascension? As you go, make disciples 
of all the people groups, baptizing them, the triune God, teaching them to do all that I've commanded you to do. And they would remember that if they loved him, they would keep his commandments. And this last command was no exception. But we see in this, we begin to get a... a remember, John is, John is showing us Jesus theologically. John is giving us a picture of Jesus that we need to keep mindful of. To see him for who he is. To open our eyes to him. So now let's talk a few minutes about this first phase. And we're going to look at this more next week. So I just want to get your, get your thought juices going. Jesus' first expression to them as a rabbi who was summoning them to follow after him was come and see. You see, again, I think we have unwittingly made disciple-making complicated and we don't appreciate that Jesus expects us to live in phases. Not to snap our fingers and be all there, nor, nor to wait until we have got it all together, we've, we've, we've wrestled with and, and, and mastered the text and, the, and the, the, the principles and the modeling, the examples, and now that we have all of this in place, now we can. That's not how Jesus operated with the first people he touched. Come and see. It was an invitation to come take a look at this. And one of the followers, Philip, picked up on it immediately and simply said to Nathaniel, come and see. He didn't, he didn't sit down with Nathaniel and go through a, uh, an argument to prove that Jesus is the Christ. He, he himself had only seen him the day before. <laughs> but he did what Jesus would teach them to do and what he would teach us to do if we will, if we will say, Lord, I'm willing, I love you, I'm thankful for you, I want to be like you, I want to be conformed to your image, I'm willing to do what you tell me to do. In fact, I learned from your mother that whatever you tell me to do, do it. And then sometimes we brace and think, what's it going to be? No, it's, it's, just, it's just this simple at this point in our study on Sunday nights. Come and see. I want to ask you something tonight. When's the last time that you said to somebody, come and see. Come and see where I worship. Come and see the people I worship with. It's just a simple invitation. And I think we have, we have maybe unwittingly discounted that. that and you, you read people and they say, that's not evangelism. That's... Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ modeled this. It cannot be wrong. It cannot be wrong. What would happen if we said, okay, I want to follow Jesus more intentionally, more intensely day by day. Maybe we can all repent that life too easily distracts us. But I want to follow him more intensely, more intentionally, day by day. And I want to, this week, encounter someone, maybe just someone I encounter in the way, and say, come, come, come attend worship with me. You know, we read a statistic several years ago that said this huge percentage, I mean, it was more than 50% of people when asked, who were not involved in church, when asked, why do you not attend church anywhere? You know what the number one answer was? No one's ever invited me. No one's ever invited me. A simple invitation. Come and see. And it gets more, it gets more complex. That's, that's where it starts. Come and see where I worship. Come and see the people I worship with. Come and see the, how we sing and we fellowship and we study the Word together. Come and see. Yeah, it'll, it'll get more intense because it'll be come see, come see where I live. Come 
into my home. Fellowship with me. Let me serve you. Let me bless you. But it starts, Jesus' method of disciple making starts with come and see. And it develops, it's, it becomes come and follow me. And then come and be with me. The, the following there meaning that, that you would commit yourself to take what he's teaching and take it to heart. That you would commit yourself to study him, what he says, what he does. And we'll, we'll notice, we'll mark this when we get into this, that he would teach them something, he would model it for them, and then he would send them out two by two to go practice it. They come back. He would teach them something, he would model it for them, and then he would have them. And you'll, you'll start thinking of passages when that's true. They've seen him perform miracles, and they say, this, this crowd on this hill, they, we need to send them home. It's going to be dark. They're not fed. They're going to get unruly. And Jesus said, you feed them. The interesting thing is he said it again after, he, after they had participated in the miraculous feeding of the thousand. You feed them. You give them something to eat. He was the master teacher, the master disciple maker. So I want to challenge you. We're going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to wrap this up here and I'm going to come down and we're going to just do a, a Q&A for a few minutes just to talk about maybe some things. Maybe the Lord's turned some lights on. Maybe, maybe he's prompted in you some things to think about and just talk for a few minutes about Jesus Christ, the disciple maker, who is, he's the recreator, which is why John had us look at his first week of ministry. But rather than resting on the seventh day, uh, he, he blessed on the seventh day. What a Savior we have. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we bow before you in Jesus' name. And we, as we read, just simply read the Scriptures, we are we're gripped in new and fresh ways at the simplicity of Jesus' model for making disciples. Forgive us, Lord, when we, when we have despised the simple and, and somehow convinced ourselves or convinced others that, that this is a really complex thing and that you've got to be really serious about this and you've, and you've got to be all in and understand some things and on and on and on and on and on. <clears throat> And somehow we have piled up Philistine rubbish in the, in the wells of pure water that you have dug for us. Help us to drink in new and fresh ways from Jesus Christ. And simply be willing to trust him that he knows what he's talking about when he, when he taught and when he modeled the manner in which we should be disciple makers. And Lord, help us burn in our minds and our consciences whatever he tells you to do, do it. That that is the path of blessing. That's the, that's the way we bless others. And that's the way we receive the blessing as well. Come, wind of God, and breathe upon us new and fresh energies and life to be disciple makers, obeying the commands of our Savior who said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.